Hello everyone, welcome to the Wellness Podcast. My name is Donatus Rubinus, I'm the host uh, of the show and uh, today we are in France, in Rouen, Ibis Styles uh, Hotel Rouen and we are here with the um, GM of new EuroLeague family member, uh, Alexei Yefimov. Alexei, welcome to the show. Thanks, thanks for the invitation. And let's start uh, from, let's say, personal. Uh, in, in this podcast, we will get to know Monaco team uh, better because there are a lot of interesting team, teams around this organization. But let's start from some personal experience. Uh, we were in Monaco a couple of days ago and we were like uh, sitting in one bar on the corner of Monaco. And there is ca some casual guy coming out of the corner. Uh, he had uh, uh, like a bag which we usually had when we were like 14 or 15 year olders. Uh, he also was in kind of casual t-shirt and shorts and stuff like that. And I thought that, I think that I know that guy. And it, it was Alex Alban, former Red Bull racing uh, mm -hmm. team driver. And my colleague Martina uh, also had a very uh, interesting conversation with uh, uh, Wozniacki, famous uh, tennis player tennis in grocery stores. So uh, in all these years in Monaco, Alexei, tell me about craziest or most impre impressive random conversations or situations you had in Monaco with, you know, a lot of stars in that place. Oh, no. I, I don't even know, but probably Djokovic. Okay. Djokovic, he was, he was practicing at the beach, Larvota beach, uh -huh. and we just, I mean, suddenly crossed. Uh -huh. Probably it's usual to see such stars like that in, in Monaco area, right? You I mean, probably are, got used to it. I mean, there are a lot of yeah. yeah, different people over here, but you know, the most important, I think that's, that's people like Monaco because mm -hmm. you, can, you can be casual and no one really cares, no matter your status. And I've actually heard that when Jord Michael Jordan is coming to France because of his probably business stuff, sometimes he asks uh, the gym for him to practice, is it true? Or let's say some NBA players want to practice uh, in Monaco gym? Yes, Nike, Nike brought a hmm. couple of times their clients uh -huh. and, they, and they, yes, they were in our gym. Mm. Can, can you name any, any players which were in your gym? It's probably not very, you know, sensitive well, information. Not sensitive at all, but uh, they ask not to do so. Okay, okay. But, okay, like guys, 100 plus million. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> not, not too many guys in that club, though. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, you're working in Monaco like fr since 2014 or 13? Since, since we went to the second division, since, since the club has been promoted to the mm -hmm. second division. Yes. So 2014. Yeah. So probably you kind of got used to the, let's say, fancy environment uh, of Monaco. It's one of the wealthiest, one of the most expensive places in all the world. Uh, but I think that uh, when it takes convincing players like Mike James, Donatus Moneta, Yuna, several stars, does it help to convince such big time players to come to Monaco? Listen, I think first of all, yeah, the, the place is really unique. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it has certain added value. So it's easier to, you know, to attract players. But I think it's not only because of the place, but also because of the organization. Mm -hmm. I mean, we are young, but I believe that if you will call any hour formal player, he will say that he, he was treated over here the best possible way. Mm. Uh, it, it's just bad that like in NCAA, for example, they can, you know, pick the player to, to show their, uh, to show them the campus and stuff. Probably Monaco doesn't have that uh, opportunity to, let's say, bring player to Monaco to show, show the environment and stuff like that, and then to sign papers for the contract. To, right? Well, but maybe they just Google yeah. <laughs> and it will be enough. But the thing is, you said, I mean, you mentioned Monaco a couple of times and you said luxury, wealthy. Mm -hmm. When you live in Monaco, you discover it from a completely different side. Mm -hmm. For example? Uh, for example? It, it's, also, it's actually okay. a very relaxing place. It's exactly. a very good feeling to be over exactly. there. And it's not only about the money, it's about the environment, about, about the sea, about the, all these palms and very, it's, it's a very secure place. Yeah, first actually. of all, it's very secure, but I think when you live in Monaco, you, know, you understand that maybe of course, security is, the, is one of the key factors, but at the same time, why you feel good over there? Because if you will, if you will come as a foreigner to any place of the world, you will feel like, like a stranger, mm -hmm. like a foreigner. Over here, I mean, you're just one among the others. Mm -hmm. Next to you will be people from different countries. Yeah. And it's much easier, you know, it's so, how to say, so international. So mm -hmm. I, think, I think this is one of the main reasons why you feel comfortable and relaxed over here. 
Yeah, because it's, there's an interesting fact that probably only one fourth of uh, Monaco residents actually, you know, are real, let's say, Monaco citiz citizens, right? Because you have like 40,000 people uh, in Monaco. I'm afraid to make a mistake, but I think mm -hmm. that Monegasques, I mean, the yeah. citizens, passport yeah. holders, I think 6,000. Even even less than that, right? Better to Google because uh, I, I, I'm afraid to make a mistake, but yes, they're mm. less, than, less than 25%. Okay. Mm. Oh, wow. And uh, talking about uh, Mike James, let's we will talk about Monaco in detail uh, later, but Mike James was the name which, let's say, made the Monaco even more famous when they started to play in the EuroLeague from, from this uh, season. Can you bring us to the start of these negotiations and how did, let's say, that uh, conversation with Sergei Dedechko, the president of the club, look like? Maybe you just saw that, you know, he, he parted ways with CSK and you were like, okay, maybe let's try to bring Mike James. How did that situation look like? I mean, first of all, uh, there is a president of Mr. Dedechko who, mm -hmm. who is here since, since the club, I mean, since we promoted to sec second division, but also we have a uh, shareholder, Mr. Fedorichev, mm -hmm. the owner of Fedcom Group. So uh, they were discussing between each other that we need to, we need to improve the roster. Mm -hmm. And then, I mean, the, the market was really small yeah. on, on, the, on the guard position, hard, really now hard to find uh, experience player uh -huh. and then i mean then suddenly we say okay like last year it it sounded like a like a joke when when yeah. mike was talking to yeah. Daugas, but okay try is a try and we reach out the agent and start talking and trying to to present all the mm -hmm. let's say benefits and all the good good points about potential coming to monaco and what was your main pitch uh, what was the main thing which you tried to focus on you know to try to convince mike uh, to sign with monaco listen i think that i think that he he was at the moment when he need new challenge i mean i think it's 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 a real challenge to to come to the team newcomer underdog mm -hmm. trying to to put it onto the new level i think this is something which which also made him let's say ready to come Mm. Was there anything unusual in these negotiations? Was it hard to, to convince Mike? Uh, to I mean, it was more or less the same. I mean, mm -hmm. I cannot say that it was something... Casual situation. I would say, say yeah, more or less, yes. And since most of the teams were uh, had their rosters almost ready for the season, were there any, let's say, rivals, uh, any uh, potential other potential possibilities for Mike to go to the other teams? I mean, there were, I think, at least two EuroLeague teams. China, but... I mean, no one actually knows what's going, what's going to happen with the Chinese market. But I mean, definitely we were not the only one. Mm. And when you signed Mike, and you already mentioned that you wanted to improve the team, uh, I I'm just curious, was it kind of planned? Because Will Thomas, for example, was also kind of last minute uh, additions. Uh, why did you decide, was it planned to, let's say, leave some roster space for the beginning of uh, September or something didn't work out the way you wanted, uh, let's say, earlier in, in summer? Okay, it's always a mix of everything. Mm -hmm. But uh, yes, we, we, we wanted Nigel Hayes, ah, but yes. it, it didn't happen. So we were, we were still on the market for the format. So I cannot say that we were waiting the last minute in purpose. Mm -hmm. But yeah, also at the same time, we are not the team which will make a lot of early moves. And uh, t tell us about uh, all these feelings, all these emotions in, in Monaco front office uh, when you actually saw that Mike is uh, signing. You know, it's, it was the, let's say it was the biggest deal of Monaco organization in all these years, uh, probably. It's, it's fair to say, not only in money-wise, but just emotionally to have Mike James as one of the biggest EuroLeague stars. So what do you remember about that? How, how unbelievable it was for you guys? Listen, I cannot say that unbelievable because at that moment we were concerned about securing home arena, okay. which probably ah. was even <laughs> more important. So, I mean, you know, okay, big deal for the for the organization, mm -hmm. for the club. But I mean, for us, the most important is to see how how will it how to see how will it affect the team and how will mm -hmm. it affect our game. So there was no any special emotions when when the deal was done mm -hmm. and when when Mike came. We were, let's say, more waiting for, 
for the season to be on, mm -hmm. to see how, I mean, what actually can it bring to the organization. And in your eyes, how it affected the team in the first game? It's, of course, very early to say, but uh, what were, you, let's say, your impressions? I mean, it's, it's early to say, and uh, I don't like to say focus only on one player, because, mm. I mean, I think ah. that, but uh, I believe that uh, in, the, in the first few minutes, it was important to have someone who will, who will take the ball and who will, you know, make a first, how mm -hmm. to say, let's say push. Mm -hmm. Because we're, we are a young organization, we are debutant of, I mean, our first ever experience in EuroLeague. Not a lot of our players yeah. used to play EuroLeague, so I think maybe it was, it was important that uh, first two, uh, two actions he, he took the ball and he, he finished by himself. And uh, what, what was it like uh, to finally have Euro, EuroLeague events uh, that night uh, in that game? Uh, were there any special emotions uh, for you, yeah, for this, the front office? Definitely, this is mm. something. I mean, this is something which for a long time we were dreaming, mm. then were even afraid to think that this, instead of a dream, it could be a goal or target. Mm -hmm. And then when it happened, this is, this is really... What do you remember the most from that night, for example? What happened before the game? Because this, uh, this couple, last couple of weeks were also very difficult for you to, to be, let's say, to have the arena granted for you not to go to any other place. Then, of course, a lot of preparation for, for the first uh, game and stuff. What do you remember the most about that kind of, you know, uh, being, let's say, nervous before the start, how it will look like? Listen, you, of course, I mean, there was certain pressure because, I mean, short time and a lot of things to to be improved and developed uh, to, to reach the EuroLeague standards. But I think that once you hear the atom, you, you mm -hmm. forget about everything. And then, then you understand, okay, EuroLeague, EuroLeague is mon in Monaco. And the most important that you, you achieve this goal, what, what was behind, you, do, you don't really focus on that. Mm. It was very um, impressive and fans stood up uh, during the EuroLeague anthem. I don't know if it was planned or something. I don't know it's, if it's a common thing for Monaco fans, but since the devotion song, you know, came in, everybody was like standing, clapping and stuff like that. I mean, the, uh, our fans, they're, they're uh, standing and clapping uh, for the first shots. For the first shots. Uh -huh. But I think they were so, how to say, excited that they, mm. they just couldn't see it. And uh, what were the main highlights for you from that game, for example? What do you remember the most? It was because it was probably a very fast night uh, for you, but what were these highlights which you will remember forever about your first day in the EuroLeague, let's say? You're talking about, uh, asking about the game? Yeah, or? Uh, yeah, the game, what happened after the game. Okay, if we say, I mean, first basket, of course, just because mm. you remember it, then maybe two no-look passes of Dimo. Mm -hmm. Don't a whole dunk. Okay, yes. I don't know. I mean, but I think, you know what, what, what I remember? Mm -hmm. And it was because, okay, we said yeah, EuroLeague is here, the game starts, you, you think you can relieve, but then you, you have excitement because of the result. Uh -huh. I mean, it's first, ever, first yes. ever match for the club. And then when three minutes till the end, we were up by 23. Mm -hmm. This is probably the first time when, okay, like, Maybe it won't be just the first game, but also first victory. Okay. Uh, you already, by the way, you mentioned uh, Donatas Matiunas. I, you already mentioned that you don't like to talk about, uh, let's say, some personalities and stuff. But since we have a lot of Lithuanian viewers, uh, what can you say about, uh, how did you find out that, you know, Donatas Matiunas is that missing piece for your team? Uh, why did you like uh, the opportunity to bring him to EuroLeague after 10 years? Well... How did you came up with this idea? We've been, we just, I mean, we were discussing what, what, I mean, who are potential, mm -hmm. potential names for us. And then we, we went through, through the list of guys who were playing in China because we expect that the uh -huh. China may not start or um, could start without imports. And uh, I mean, Donatas, okay. Also, while choosing a player, we don't, look just on the profile. We want to check, I mean, the personality and uh, everything out of the out of the court. And Dima is the guy who, okay, no question about his skills, mm -hmm. but he's great professional. We wanted someone who, who will, who will give an example also. 
So I think I think that we like Dimo as a player, but also as a person, because we we are trying to take care about the locker room also and and the chemistry. Uh, if you had an opportunity to sign one more superstar for Monaco team, let's say not from all these NBA guys coming to uh, practice in, in Monaco gym during the summer, but what would be your, let's say, another next starter which you would like to bring? Maybe as a GM you have any favorite players or something like that? Well, first of, all, I, first of all, I would say maybe maybe let's try to see how we're going to work out with, with the current players with whom we have. I'm not sure if... Do you have any crush on uh, you know some 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 stars like you were dreaming about Euroleague uh, yes. with the front office? Maybe you have any dreams about some players you know which you would like to have, which you admire uh, watching them in our teams? Hmm. I mean, there are a lot of good players. A of lot course. of good, yeah. but every time when I when I'm thinking about them, I say, okay, like probably they're too good for our organization for the moment. But let, uh, 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 maybe we will try to answer next summer. Yeah, I hope so. Fair, fair enough. <laughs> I hope so. And uh, the next thing I want to discuss uh, is your uh, personality. Uh, we we will have to, uh, we will try to get to know people who who are behind Monaco uh, team. And your story is incredible. Uh, you started as a sports journalist, uh, yes. journalist for Sports Express. Yep. Right uh, at the age of twenty one or even earlier. Earlier, I think. Okay. Eighteen or nineteen. So. Maybe. If you were a journalist right now, what story you would write about Monaco organization or any player? What would you be focusing on the most? The most? I mean, in the intro probably I would write that Monaco is the only one place where miracles are still happening because okay. I don't know how to describe the, all the way which the, the club uh, went through uh, during the last seven years. Uh -huh. Because we started, I mean, the, the club won third, uh, fourth, third, second French division. When we entered French Pro A at that moment, mm -hmm. we won regular season, we won Leaders' Cup, which actually we won three, three times in a row. Mm -hmm. And then we were, we had BCL experience, then EuroCup experience, now EuroLeague. I mean, honestly speaking, I, I, I couldn't even dream about this. And if someone would say, okay, what is possible to repeat from all this? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure because, for example, as for me, to win second French division is maybe harder rather than... Okay, why? Uh, rather than to, to show something in the fir first division. Mm -hmm. Because at that moment it was only two foreigners allowed, mm -hmm. I believe. And all quality French players, they... They, they mm -hmm. play in the first division, I mean, except, of course, the guys who are playing NBA EuroLeague, yeah. they're all in, in, in first division. So it was very hard to, to win second division, especially from the first to ten. And what do you remember the most about the beginnings of Monaco team? When you just joined the, the organization, what were the main challenges for you as a young main sports director? The, yeah. the main challenges, uh, challenge was how to attract people mm -hmm. and come to the gym. Because there are so many different uh, entertainments in Monaco uh -huh. daily on the daily basis. Yeah. So how to attract the people, especially when you have successful soccer team mm -hmm. above you. Yeah. I mean above because <laughs> our you're playing is there. under the stadium. Yeah. yeah. So what's the answer? H how to attract all these uh, people? Did you find that answer in all these years? I mean, as as we have more and more people. Probably there are answers, but... Do you uh, find the key? You know, what, how to, let's say, reach the hearts of uh, Mo Monescu, Mogas Monegask? Monegask, Monegask people, yeah. Uh, I don't know, but I think it's... Monaco is small and uh, we promote the club as something... Okay, from one, one point of view, like a family thing so mm -hmm. fans they i mean they're even called like roca family yeah. some of them from another point of view something which let's say like monaco national team mm -hmm. so that they they could be proud of that so if if you will if you will try to google you will not see uh interviews of uh, of the president or even myself we mm -hmm. because we 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 thought that the best would be to stay behind okay so that instead of saying, okay, project which, which has been created on, or led by 
Ukrainians, foreigners, yeah. whatever, people will will mm -hmm. have personal attachment to it, saying, okay, this is this is our oh. national team. This is why I'm Monegas and I'm proud that I have this team. Do you think that you managed to reach this goal? Do you feel that it's is going the I think way? I, I think we still need to work on it, but mm -hmm. I believe so. And also probably one of the most challenging things in the beginning was to not to be considered because there, there was already a strong ice monaco soccer brand uh -huh. so we were thinking if we will if we will present ourselves just as ice monaco if you know if people will will consider us that's why uh in the internal market we are called like rocket team yeah while elsewhere we are using ice monaco brand because it's it's well known and we can benefit from it. Mm. But the thing is that you actually have nothing to do with the football team, right? Because some people might think that, oh, they get money from football team. No, for the, mom for the moment, soccer and basketball clubs are mm. uh, totally independent organizations. And what Roca means? Roca? I mean, means that uh, the Prince Palace yeah. is situated on the rock. Ah, okay. Everything which, which uh -huh. is within the principality belongs actually to, to the prince. So the mm. team from the rock, the team from from up there mm -hmm. and uh, talking about uh, Monaco people uh, again I was doing a research and it was said that one third of uh, uh, Monaco residents uh, let's say there are millionaires how would you describe the profile of let's say typical Roca team basketball fan which is uh, watching your games which is following your games which uh, which is coming to the arena to watch you I cannot say that there is a typical one mm. because there are a lot of different people it can be celebrity i mean you you saw that we had charles leclerc who is yeah. who is coming pretty often we have we have a lot of other celebrities coming but at the same time we have we have people who are living not only in monaco but in the neighborhoods who are coming and supporting as well so you can you can i think that at the stand you can see everyone here can be millionaire over here uh -huh. can be i don't know journalist uh, barista yes. engineer whatever and uh, talking about these stars yes it was very impressive to to, to see formula uh, racing drivers uh, in in the stands uh, prince is also uh, watching following your uh, your, your team what do you remember uh, the most uh, which let's say very well known uh, people personalities uh, were in like in the stance of uh, Roca team, well, which they... maybe even impressed you. Maybe th you didn't expect that these people are uh, basketball fans and wanted to, to watch your team, for example. I don't know. I, I let me think. Who could be hard to answer? Because uh, I mean, almost every game we have it, we have someone. It's so. something usual for you already. So you <laughs> don't kind of you know make any exclusions no. or something. No. Following your career, um, how did that happen that at the age of 21 you became the sports director of Kiev? Or it was uh, an uh, assistant uh, job? Yeah, it first? was, uh, first it was, I, I, uh, I entered Kiev as a press officer, uh -huh. BC Kiev. And then I was traveling with the team all the time. And then during the season, sports director left. Mm -hmm. And actually, they, at that moment, there was no one who can replace him. So I've been, I've been offered or proposed to finish the season just, okay, like a team mm -hmm. manager. And this is how it started. So probably accidentally. Uh, did you like writing or doing journalism stuff before? Or you always I, had that idea, I would like to do something more than to be with the team and maybe to run the team one day? I love basketball and I wanted to... To work more and more with the club uh -huh. because before i was working okay in sport express newspaper then uh it was also mega sport tv channel and there was another one so i was i was like main occupation was was journalism but i wanted to find a pathway how to mm -hmm. enter a club uh, if I'm not correct, if I'm not uh, wrong, I think that Andrei Vatutin has the same story. He was the journalist, then the press officer, and then he became the uh, CSK Moscow. I don't know, maybe you had any conversations with him? Not, or not the same story. The story? He's, he's, he's much more successful than he me. He had more, he has, more time he, than you. He has, yeah, so he has great maybe one day. Record. I mean, 
this is this this would be not easy to follow. Do you had <laughs> any? Did you have any dinner with him or, or lunch where you also shared your let's say beginnings of your stories? And uh, we ne we never tackled this. Okay, so maybe uh, this season you will have an opportunity. Maybe. Uh, what are your uh, let's say? Um, GMs which you admire the most, which you always followed uh, the most, let's say, to get good, you know, examples uh, from their experience? I think it's not only about following GMs, it's also about following the, the entire organization and the way, because I think that it's not only GM, it's, it's, always, it's always connection with the coach. Also, uh, Yeah, I, I mean, there are a lot of aspects. I, I don't, I don't focus on personalities. Let's say I'm, I'm more focused on the the way they communicate, the way they choose the strategy, mm -hmm. the decision making as well, taking a risk or, or I mean, where where they think that it's, it's how to say, it was that. Mm. And do you guys try to build this, let's say, strategy, this approach uh, together with uh, Mr. Uh, Diadechko, let's say? Uh, what, what was the beginning of that uh, connection? Uh, because if I'm uh, right, he he was uh, the owner of Donetsk team, yes, right? He was, he was and he took and you from uh, Kiev uh, for a sports uh, director position, right? How, how did connection started? How your friendship started? Listen, uh, okay, I cannot say friendship because still I I, I believe that he's president, and okay, I always say yeah. as a as job an relationship. Employee, but let's yes. say, yeah, uh, thanks to Sasha Obradovich. Mm. Sasha Bradovich is the one who actually, let's say, opened that door and gave me gave mm -hmm. me a, a chance because uh, in BC Kiev, mm -hmm. Sasha was 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 working, and then uh, the team had financial problems and Sasha left. And then one year after he came to Donetsk. Uh, by that moment, I didn't know Mr. Dedeshko, and then mm -hmm. he said, "Okay, I would like." Alexei to to join our organization. So he was the one, let's say, who who helped me to mm. get to get that job. And how you would describe Mr. Dedechko? He's very passionate basketball fan. And one in, the, in your interviews, you told extremely, that he's heart passion. and soul of this organization. Organization, let's say. Definitely. What ca can you say about him to you know for people to get to know uh, one of the guys who is running the team, and uh, at the same time w one who wants to build. Uh, The, the franchise, the image of whole team, the culture of Monaco team. Let's say that he he's someone who, first of all, incredibly dedicated. I never seen. Okay, I cannot. I don't want to compare, but I know oh. it's really rare to find someone who is so passionate and who mm -hmm. who is so in love with basketball. What, so, what, I, what kind of stories would tell? What do you remember the most that, oh my God, this guy is really passionate about his job. What do you remember uh, him being passionate or very active in, in his job? No, but this is, I mean, this is on the daily basis. Mm. I think that if, if we'll give a call now, he, and you can ask about any EuroLeague game mm -hmm. which has been played or, or local leagues where they already started, you can, you can get an answer. Uh, he, he, he follows. Mm -hmm all the markets. This is really incredible. How to find how to find that time and passion because he has his his main occupation. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. So how to find the energy and to to watch so so many basketball and to enjoy it. I mean this is really really incredible. And he also takes an, an important uh, role in like building the team, right? You're of building the yes, team indeed. together. It's not indeed. like just your general no, management no, 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 you no, have no, to do course, all the things. Of course yes. he he's 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 very important mm. in this. Uh, what is He's, let's say I would say main main piece. Mm. And what was very interesting, I don't know if it's Ukrainian thing, when you when but when you work for Donetsk, there was a situation where the head coach was fired and you took the head coach position. Is it like how basketball in Ukraine is run? Mm. <laughs> how it's like that? Because from the press officer you went to the sports director okay, and then, then as the head coach and you won the first game against Azomash, which is crazy because it was good team uh, back then eight years ago. Uh, listen, first of all, first of all, I, I, I had this experience probably because I did my job <laughs> bad because we, we, we had terrible season and we, we changed two coaches uh -huh. and then president decided that no matter who, who can come and I mean, if, if you will bring another coach, mm. he will not be able to To change the situation. To change the probably. situation. So probably it will be, it will, if you're bringing in 
third coach during the season, mm. then probably you are already thinking about about the future season. So he he made that kind of uh, I would say unexpected decision. Yeah. <laughs> what do you remember the most about it? Because you were twenty six year old. Uh, I remember the first game actually. I think was Astana. Mm, okay. In Astana, when we lost in overtime because of my mistake. Okay, <laughs> of course. <laughs> but, uh, but then, I mean, first of all, I realized that I don't want to be a coach. Uh -huh. Then, second thing, I realized that it's much harder to, I mean, that it looks completely different when you are uh -huh. at the bench, at the helm of the of the team, and then. So I just wanted to do my job better, my yeah. main my you, you job better to avoid, to avoid this in future. Yeah, you take the best experience of that uh, situation, yes. you know, yes. in order to help yourself uh, for the future uh, yes. situations. But, but somehow we managed to get into the VTB playoffs. playoffs yeah. Yes. Wow, that, that was crazy journey for that team. It was crazy. We, we, I think we won six or seven VTB games in a row. Wow. So, but you still thought that it's not for you? Definitely. That, okay. Definitely. Okay. I mean, I was I was sure that this is this is not for me. But you had some basketball background before, right? You played yes. basketball at least in basketball schools. schools yeah, and stuff. yeah. I, I used to play, but mm -hmm. I doubt that I would ever reach Monaco as a player. Ah, <laughs> say. Okay. And uh, talking about Ukrainian experience, Donetsk was very ambitious uh, project back then. You had also uh, basketball programs uh, for uh, for young young people, young basketball players and stuff, and it was building and building up. But then, of course, war happened, and in 2014, uh, during the that Donbas war, uh, the arena arena was set on fire, and it actually the fire destroyed all yes. the arena. What do you remember the mo uh, most about that time? Uh, that situation. I don't know if you were in the office when all these situations happened. What was happening in your life back in the day? No, we, when this when this situation became, let's say, unstable or mm. or Risky. dangerous, we we left. Go, yeah, we left. So I mean, I saw I saw Arena and everything only on TV. I I, I didn't come back to Donetsk when the situation became worse. Mm. What was the feeling? I mean, you worked uh, so hard for the team, for the organization, and it, like ev everything was destroyed. But at, at that moment, you think not only about mm. about uh, organization or the club, you think, I mean, uh, in general about the, uh. the situation, about the people, because it, it really, I mean, it's sad and... It's more than basketball, let's say. Indeed, I mean, this is uncomparable with basketball. Mm. Talking about, about basketball things, you, you joined uh, Mr. Dedechko uh, in Monaco and one of the important parts of that team was also coach Zvezdan Mitrovic, who's with the team uh, to this uh, day. And Zvezdan also had a good resume in Ukraine, but at that time it seemed like it was not a good timing for him. He didn't have much success uh, in, in these years before joining Monaco. Why you guys thought that Zvezdan Mitrovic is the right guy, the best guy for the, for the position you, you wanted? Because we knew him from from the past when he was working in Ukraine, and he was doing great job with uh, with the teams which have been mostly built with the local players. Mm, okay. And this was our case in, in France. We had only two foreigners, oh. second division, so we wanted to have someone who can who can make the the team better without involving foreigners because we didn't have we didn't have opportunity to mm. to to have more foreigners so we wanted someone who knows how to how to push the the team you have beyond the limits what do you like the most about coach mitrovic as as, as far as i saw he's a big star here in, in in monaco everybody it seemed like everybody loves him he was very important for all the success this team have uh, reached uh, Personally, what do you like the most about him? Not just as a coach, but as a personality too. As a personality? Yeah. He he is hard worker, but when there is a need, when there is a need, and when there is a time and situation, he knows how to how to switch and how to you know to relieve all the pressure and release all the pressure and how to how to enjoy. Hmm. I think it's not easy when 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 you are a coach and when you have a lot of pressure to find a way how to, you know, to... Approach situations about, approach people? 
and how how to stay how to keep uh, calmness or something like that the same line even how to yeah how to be peaceful probably not uh-huh. peaceful peaceful yeah, with peace, himself I don't know, with, the with, with, with himself yeah I mean uh-huh. how to how to how to divide and separate okay uh-huh. this is job I did everything what I could even if something didn't work okay tomorrow I will work again mm. even harder and I will succeed but it doesn't mean that if today is a not the best day that I need to how to say I need to kill myself uh-huh. he knows how to he's he's super dedicated but at the same time he knows when when there is a moment uh-huh. when there is a need to to switch on something different rather than basketball and what is interesting about the coach he has that kind of very different image uh, on public for example because people watch him in the games he gets some technicals he's shouting at players and stuff like that but as far as i have understood it seems like he's let's say players coach he has a personality which um, gives him an opportunity to feel his players that they want to fight for him right is that, that yeah, correct? He, he, he's the one who can who can really uh, force people to follow him mm-hmm. like uh, having a great leadership skills and stuff he, like that. he has yes he has this mm-hmm. talking about the front office about the organization we have to understand that in Monaco in the principality of Monaco there are so many different rules tax- taxations uh, and stuff which makes uh, the situation and you know can make the running the team in a very complicated and tricky way somehow uh, what kind of examples you you could uh, tell us which uh, would help us understand that it's different to have a team in, in Monaco because of, of all tax difference uh, and other rules uh, or something like that well i mean uh, probably the the first of all there is a Monegasque law, Monaco law mm. and French law and we need to to uh, navigate to navigate because because systems. we are we are yes because we are a uh, Monegasque company I mean as the club we are mm. we are a company which has been registered in Monaco under Monegasque law but we are participating in the French league so we need to we need to respect also the mm. French law and and regulations and but I would say that there is no there is no when you when you get used to it there is no mm. any let's say specific things which you need uh-huh. to really to take care, to take care of but for example what are the biggest advantages or disadvantages advantages because, yeah taxation Adva- of course uh, besides the place of and course. stuff besides the area taxation is different okay can you be a bit more in detail you know why it's different in monaco and why it's you know different in, in france the taxation because system first, for first, of, first of all because uh, in monaco income tax doesn't exist mm. so uh, only french players who are playing in monaco mm. they are still obliged to pay income tax in france mm. while foreigners they they don't need to pay any income tax in monaco so let's say it gives you an opportunity to assign for foreign players uh, on better terms right yes yes but I mean, it depend. It depend from the country of origin of the player, mm. because in some cases, uh, for example, for the player will be in terms of taxes, could be better to go to Russia, let's say, rather than mm. rather than Monaco. So it's it depends on on each particular case. But yes, the uh, the fact that there is no no any income tax in mm. Monaco, it it gives us a lot of benefits and probably talking about the disadvantages it seems like uh, you have uh, some complicated situation with the arena right that was a big uh, thing for you to play in the EuroLeague in this arena and since it's very expensive in Monaco it's very hard Uh, let's start let's start that there's no place actually in Monaco to build uh, a huge uh, arena can you be more in detail about that what are let's say solutions uh, for Monaco team looking in, in future because okay you were doing about the EuroLeague at first it was enough but now if we want to promote uh, or to let's say develop your project you have to think about uh, our scenarios yes but at the same time you need to to have long-term vision and you mm. you need to to assume that you need to make some steps right away otherwise I mean uh, you will not be able to 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 keep the level so uh, during the summer, uh, we increased the capacity from three to four thousand, mm. and next summer, it will be bigger renovation, and we will have five thousand. We will we will 
exceed 5,000. Mm. So this is something which, which probably is the best what could be done now with the current arena. Is it enough for the EuroLeague? For example, uh, the scenario where you would keep your place in the EuroLeague is by making the playoffs. Uh, that's right. So if you're kind of making the playoffs and you raise the capacity to 5,000, is that okay for your league? Or again, you might have some situations. No, then we, in, in case, well, first of all, it's hard to, it's even harder to dream about, yeah. about <laughs> <laughs> players. Rather but than as you said, miracles are happening. Okay, you know? so, but uh, 5,000, 5,000 will be enough. Hmm. I mean, we, we will satisfy the EuroLeague regulations and standards. Did you Be ever... Because we are not... not uh, shareholder club, so mm. we're not a licensed club. Yes. Uh, did you ever consider uh, the possibility of building the arena and what would be conditions of building the, uh, the arena? Because I heard that since the situation in Monaco with constructions is so difficult that they even tr uh, consider like making some buildings on, on, on sea, like uh, putting sand, I don't know, or something no, like no, that. Now no, uh, the government is finishing uh, artificial uh -huh. part of the land, yes. Uh -huh. But uh, to find to find a place to build up an arena, of course it's difficult. But you know, maybe it could be uh, it could be somewhere like across the street, let's say, like yeah. this from Monaco. Because, for example, uh, famous Monte Carlo uh, Rolex Masters tennis tournament. Mm -hmm. Do you know where where is it played? No, in France. It's it's the the uh, country club is situated on the French territory. Uh -huh. What in, in, in which area? It's but it's I mean it's one meter from, yes. from Monaco. Everyone yes. considered it, it as, yes. a, as a Monaco. Uh -huh. So maybe we we could try to find something which is next to us. Hmm. What is very unique about Monaco that uh, we remember from our personal experience that if you wanted to, to try to call Uber, you have to go across the street. There's a married hotel uh, next to uh, next, uh, yes. uh, Stade Louis. Stade Louis, right? yes. Stade yes, Louis and then you can call the Uber. And uh, for example, there are different rules with masks because in Monaco it's yes. mandatory, in, mandatory, in France not. So let's say being across the street is, uh, changes all the situation. Do you remember any personal experiences which were like, you know, had, you know, for you to adjust and it was weird for you at the, in the beginning? I don't. Or it's so casual for you that... And now it's casual, definitely. Uh -huh. But before, I mean, before it was, sometimes it was hard to understand mm -hmm. like where you are. Why it's happening like that. Yeah. So but, tell me what is more likely to have the arena across the street of Monaco territory or to have the new arena on, on, on sea, for example? Well, I think the most realistic and what will be happened is 5,000 capacity of the current arena. What shall be next step? Uh, what would be next step? I cannot say at the moment because we, we really need to, to make deep studies. This is really it's not easy to find a place to build up the arena and it's not only about uh, building an arena uh, it's about the entire infrastructure around it mm -hmm. the pathways how to how to mm -hmm. enter because you saw that i mean the roads are tiny yeah so if if you are dreaming about ten thousand arena you need to understand where how the people will get into the arena where they leave their their cars and everything. So it's not a, it's not only about arena. It's mm -hmm. it's there are a lot of related questions, which which shall be uh, studied. Mm. And uh, to finish it up about Mon Monaco organization, uh, you have a pretty small front office. Uh, yes. Let's say. Uh, is it also because of some uh, regulations in, in, in uh, Monaco? It, it, or we, will, we, 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 will, we will increase the, ah. the, the office. This is just because maybe because our sport results were, uh -huh. I mean, we were, we were doing too fast on the, on the court, and, but still we need to grow as, as a front office. Mm. And uh, to finish the, it up, uh, I have two questions. First of all, what is the next step what is the next dream for Monaco, except from the arena, which we already discussed, you know, increasing the capacity? Playoffs. Players. Playoffs. 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 Dream? Uh-huh. 
what do you think? How long it might take? You know, it, it took uh, you seven years to to reach the Euroleague from the lower divisions. What do you think? How, how many years it will take to to make that next step in the Euroleague? Hard to say. Still, I said that this is mm -hmm. this is more a dream rather than a goal or task. Mm -hmm. But I mean, why not to try? <laughs> of course, and. What is the next goal, the next dream for you personally, uh, Alexei Yefimov, uh, uh, as a 35-year-old uh, GM in this business? I would, I would love to continue here because I think that I got unique uh, opportunity to work somewhere from zero, from the early beginning. And I think this is, this is not easy to, to, to get that, that kind of uh, chance in your life. So I think that for me, the dream would be to to stay with Monaco and to see Monaco reaching the new level. Okay, Alex. So <laughs> best of luck uh, chasing Thanks your dreams. I appreciate it. It was Alexey Yefimov, uh, the general manager of Monaco team. Thanks all uh, for watching. Uh, you can follow basketnews.com. You can follow the podcast on basketnews.com and also on all the main uh, audio and video platforms.